Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 70, which reads as follows. Ma se ma se kusagena balo bunjaya bojanang na so sankata dhamma nang kalang aghati solasing which means Mase Mase Kusagina month by month, month after month, if a fool should Balo Bunjaya Bojanang a fool should eat just the tip of uh, a grass, kusa grass worth of food as an austerity is the point. Natso sankata dhamma nang kalanga agheti so agheti so thing. Agati kalang agati so thing. They are not worth such a person is not worth one sixteenth part of someone who has well weighed the dhamma or someone by whom those by whom the dhamma is well measured. It seems a bit awkward to use the word well-measured, but you have to understand the, the context. It's in relation with the minuscule amount of uh, food that you can take on a, on a piece of grass, blade of grass. So it's the contrast. Because what the verse means is uh, the idea of putting significance on the fact that you're eating so very little, like as though that were some great thing. The Buddha said, "Well, um, you know, knowing the me knowing the measurement in food to that extent and being so precise in the, the the minuscule amount of food you take is nothing. Being able nothing compared to being able to uh, well measure the dhamma. So this is a story, another one of these well-known Buddhist stories. This one is about a naked ascetic." who, according to the uh, backstory, was once a monk in a time of a past Buddha. And he wasn't a very good monk, but he was, well, he couldn't have been that bad. He was just kind of, it seems, a little bit lazy or a little bit attached to his supporters. So he had a family or a group of families who were supporting him, and he got kind of attached to them. And so one day this enlightened Arahat monk came to uh, stop at his monastery, was on his way here or there, and stayed overnight. And well, while he was there, I guess in the afternoon, he went in, they went into the village and the lay people saw them. And one of the, one of the families who supported this um, the resident monk was so taken by the deportment of the enlightened monk that he gave him a, a robe, gave him cloth for a robe, and uh, treated him nicely and, and gave him a, a nice seat and, and treated him sort of um, quite privileged um, out of faith for the obvious attainments that this monk had. And the other monk uh, was not happy with this. He got scared thinking, uh, what's going to happen to me if this monk becomes... He got jealous. If, if this monk becomes well-loved by this family, they're going to think I'm nothing, because compared to him, I really am nothing. And so rather than be happy that to have this enlightened monk with him, it's kind of ironic where most of us are just wishing for such a, a being to come near. near. He got quite um, crazed with jealousy. And... In the morning, he thought to himself, well, if uh, uh, before the morning, he actually, uh, in the evening when they got back to the monastery, he, uh, he was so crazed with jealousy that he actually scolded the Arahant monk and told him how he wasn't worthy of his robes, he wasn't worthy of this, uh, the, the, the seats or the bedding that they had given him and so on and uh, saying that it would be better if you were to go naked than to wear the cloth given in faith. Uh, one's, uh, one like you who has no goodness inside, 
better if you were to eat only excrement than to uh, eat the food provided by these uh, faithful people, you who have no goodness in you, that kind of thing. So he cursed him in all these horrible ways and totally uncalled for, unwarranted. And uh, and then he went into his room and, and figured, well, that's enough. That, that Now he'll get the hint and he'll take off. And sure enough, the... Um, or whatever he thought. Anyway, the monk, the, the, the Arahant monk realized that this was a really bad thing to, for the other monk if he were to stay. It was going to be a great source of demerit for him to have all this anger and jealousy inside. So even before the, the, the night was over, he, he left. He, he continued on his way and without saying goodbye. In the morning, actually, the resident monk thought the Arahant was still there. And so he got really scared that if they, he figured if we go into uh, into the village for alms, then this monk is just going to show me up and he'll never want to leave. He'll take my place as the resident monk. So after sweeping out the monastery, so he was an okay monk, he did his duties like sweeping. But then he goes, uh, because it's a routine that when it's time to go for alms, he have to ring the bell. So he goes and he takes his fingernail and he just touches his fingernail to the bell and he says, well, there I have rung the bell. And then he went off into the village. When he gets to the village, the uh, supporting family says, oh, where is that other monk that, that came yesterday? We were going to offer food to him as well. The resident monk shook his head and said, oh, he was, uh, that monk, is, I don't know, I, he didn't hear me sweeping and he didn't hear me when I rang the bell. He must be sleeping in because of uh, after getting all that uh, the, the luxurious bed that you gave him and, and being treated so well, he's probably still lazing around in bed. Anyway, well, I shouldn't shouldn't drag this out too much because we've got to get into the main story. But uh, to make a long story short, the layperson gave him some food to bring back to the other monk, and on the way back to the monastery, he saw that this food was so good and. Um, uh, such rich and and um, delicious quality that uh, he, knew, he 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 figured because he had no no really under, real understanding of enlightenment that if this monk were to uh, taste this food he would be stuck and and would never want to leave so instead of bringing it back to the monastery he actually threw the food out on the side of the road as a result of this bad, these bad deeds that he did. Um, it actually says that he had done many, many years of meditation, but the commentary um, specifically m uh, mentions or, or states that uh, all of that meditation was unable to protect him from these evil deeds. And based on this one instance of doing evil deeds, when he died he went to hell and, and roasted for a long, long time. When he was born again as a human being, he still had the residue of the bad karma, and this is where the story begins. He was born in a rich household, but he would only eat his own excrement. From, uh, from the day he was born, all he would eat was his own um, excrement, so he wouldn't eat any, any food that people prepared for him. And uh, more than that, he uh, well, he wouldn't eat. He wouldn't. He would only eat his own excrement as a result of this twisted mind that he had. It's an interesting aspect of karma. And I'll get into a little bit later um, that it actually twists your mind. And rather than other people only feeding him excrement, it was all that he would eat. And so his family found out about this and, and realized that. And he wasn't changing his ways. They thought he'd grow out, grow out of it. He didn't grow out of it. And no matter what they did, bringing any sort of choice food to him, he was his mind was so twisted with the bad karma that uh, he, he he had no taste for anything but his own ex but excrement. And so they kicked. And eventually, they kicked him out, and um, he had to go and live on his own. And and the naked ascetics took him in, and. Uh, he lived with them for a while, but eventually they found out that he, they also found out that he was eating excrement. They'd go in for alms and he'd stay back and he'd say, oh no, I'll get food by myself. 
And every day he did the same thing, and they, they, they wondered where he was getting food, so they stopped. And they, instead of going, they, they snuck and, and took a look where he was getting his food from. It turns out he's getting his food from the local, um, or from the monastery, this, the, mon the naked ascetic monastery from their uh, latrines you know, under, under the outhouses. So they kick him out as well. And he goes and stays by the public latrines and when people go go and do their business he hides and when they leave he goes, goes in and eats their excrement this is how the story goes this is the back story uh, when the buddha finds him which of course the buddha does he's um He's become quite a character in the area because what he does, is, people are of course wondering why he's hanging out near the latrines. He, so he, he takes on this character, and this is where the verse comes in. He takes to standing on one leg, leaning up against the, the side of this uh, rock face, and standing on, standing on one leg, leaning up against the side of the cliff, and standing with his mouth, mouth opened. Uh, facing the wind and so when, when people would come up they'd say who are you and he'd say I'm a wind eater and say all I eat is the, is is the wind and that's how I survive so he concocted this tale about and then they asked well why are you standing on one foot and he said oh well I have such I'm such a, a powerful ascetic that if I were to place both feet on the earth it couldn't support my weight and so on and so on and he he basically lies through his teeth and actually becomes a guru of sorts or, or a, a holy man of sorts in the area, quite well known, living in this area near the latrines, this sort of smelly, filthy area, uh, which would be considered a, a pretty extreme uh, asceticism. He says, I, n I never lie down, I just stand here all the time. But then when people left, of course, he would go and, and, and find a place to sleep or, or whatever. It, it was all just a big lie. It's just so he could stay near the latrines and eat people's, urine, uh, eat people's feces and excrement. And so one morning, as the story, these stories always go, the Buddha was sending out his mind, trying to think of who in the universe, trying to see who in the universe whether they be in heaven or whether they be on earth or, or in whatever realm who would most benefit from his teaching that day. And on, that, on one day he saw this uh, Jambudika, this uh, naked ascetic, sort of this sham ascetic. And right, so in the last part that we get into the verse is um, people were, got so, were so... Um, so attracted and so so encouraged and, and excited by his um, his asceticism that they wanted to start they, they came to offer him things and so people would offer him food and offer him robes and everything and they pressed pressed these upon him and tried again and again to get him to take them and so finally pretending to relent he takes a blade of grass and he dips his blade of grass into their food and uh, and just takes a taste of it, and he said that that will suffice for your for your merit for your goodness because um, he figured he, the 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 theory of of course is that um, they get good good merit if they, uh, they if it's a good thing for them to give to holy men, and so thinking that he was a holy man giving him the food, if he were to reject it outright, he would be stopping them from doing a good deed. So he said, well. That, that's enough for you to get a, to gain uh, the goodness of giving to such a holy person like me. And so that's that's how he became sort of known as as this guy who, who ate from the tip of all he ate all he would eat is enough to cover the tip of a blade of grass. So that's where the Buddha found him. And then there's this long story, but I won't go into it about the, the meeting with this ascetic. Uh, but basically, in the end, he, he he tries to pull a fast one on the Buddha and says, "Oh, I'm this ascetic, and I have to stand on one leg, and I only eat wind." And and, uh, and the Buddha said, basically called him a liar, and and said, "You know, the, the the truth is, you've just been lying to everybody this whole time, and now you're trying to lie to me. Truth is, you're not an arahant, and you have no clue. 
The truth is, the reason why you're, you're here eating people's excrement is because of deeds that you've done in the past. And he told him about, he explains to him about the deeds that he's done in the past, all the evil deeds that he did to this other monk. And then Jambudika um, becomes, a monk, uh, becomes a monk and then uh, eventually an arahant. So that's the background story. Getting into what this actually means to us, um, because here we have a story of um, well, the, ma the main aspect of it is the uh, contrast between asceticism um, and, and the verse itself doesn't even talk about false asceticism but um, you know, it talks about ascetic, an ascetic act like if it were the case that someone were only eating from the tip of a blade of grass the contrast between that and the asceticism or, or extreme practice in the Buddhas, in Buddhism, which is merely the extreme practice of renunciation and, and understanding, um, really, really, it's the extreme of of knowledge, in the sense of coming to understand the true nature or the entire nature of reality. And so the verse says that uh, you can't compare the two. But there's a couple of other things we can understand from this verse. The, the, the story ends that how um, his meditation practice that we said wasn't able to stop him from going to hell actually comes back and is a support for him to become an arahant. So he actually becomes enlightened once he, he gives up his asceticism and his, his false asceticism. He's actually able to become a monk very quickly um, they say this one of those cases where the robes just appeared out of nowhere, they appeared very easily maybe. They were easily found. And um, he was able to become an arahant quite quickly. So this is the first, the, 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 the first thing I think worth mentioning about this verse, uh, the story actually, before getting into the verse, is how um, rightly and clearly it it differentiates between the power of karma. So the power of evil deeds and how they last and how they affect the mind. So this gives us a hint about people wondering how karma works and what is it and where is it and so on. Um, this, is a, this is sort of exemplary of, of um, the kind of results that you would expect from really bad karma, that it actually changes your mind. and. Why I think it's exemplary is, is you can see this sort of case in people in the world today, um, sometimes not so extreme, sometimes just as extreme, but quite often not so extreme. But the person, for example, a stingy person will just not want to accept gifts. People will give them something and, and they, they will be uninterested in the gift. You know, Even if it's something they can use, they'll be like, well, but I'm fine with this um, substandard uh, that I have, or that I'm, I'm fine without it, you know, even though they're not, even though it's causing them suffering to be without it. Uh, this, it actually does twist your mind in this way. You can see this in people in the world. Um, the, the biggest one I can think of is stingy people who aren't, who aren't uh, comfortable taking gifts from others, whereas the opposite, of course, is true. You can see people who are, are generous have no problem taking gifts from others. I mean, it's actually kind of logical. If a person uh, is generous, then then they don't feel guilty taking from others because they know that they're, you know, just as generous as these people. They know what it means to give, and they, they, there's an understanding there. Whereas a person who is stingy will feel uh, guilty if they were to take too much. So the way they can uh, rationalize being stingy is by not accepting gifts from others. So it's actually, it's, it's um, you know, something mystical about it. But this is a very important aspect of how karma works, it actually can get so far as to twist your mind in this way that you wind up eating your own excrement. And the other aspect, the other part of it, which is maybe more interesting for us as meditators, is how far-reaching and long-lasting the effects of your meditation are said to be. And this is uh, sort of common wisdom shared by meditation teachers in most traditions that the meditation practice we do, especially because it's so um, involved with such a, a deep part of who we are, you know, the, the very core of our psyche, 
it's something that lasts not only through this life, not only in the next life, but it's something that can potentially last for a long, long time until the, like the seed that is in the ground, until the water fall, the rain falls, and the seed can can grow. Um, when the conditions are right, the person's past meditation can come up at any time to be a support. So, um, it's kind of as an as a um, uh, reassurance for us that our meditation is no matter whether we become enlightened in this life or not it's not wasted the goodness that you gain through your meditation is not in vain so I thought it worth mentioning those and, and, and kind of pointing that out and uh, affirming that but the main point here in all equally interesting is in regards to the difference in practices I guess there's two points. The first one is into fake in regards to fake asceticism. Um, it's very it's common to find people focusing so much of their energy on external uh, appearances. So religious people, you should never judge a religious person by their appearance, um, at least not in a positive way. You, know, you shouldn't. If if you see a person, you know, obviously doing bad deeds or or, or, or totally unfocused in in their behavior in their speech, um, then then you can probably be be sure that you know, it's indicative of something wrong inside. But just because a person is sitting quiet and 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 speaking softly or um, performing um, all sorts of uh, seemingly amazing asceticisms. Uh, not a reason to think that the person isn't, as the Buddha said, a, a fool inside. Balo bunjaya bojanang. So it's a fool, a fool can do these things. A fool can eat off the tip of a blade of grass. That kind of um, you know, severity or that kind of explicitness or, or uh, intricacy of, of practice is nothing compared to the intricacy or the, the subtlety of understanding. And so the second part here is the difference in value between asceticism and wisdom or understanding or enlightenment. That uh, asceticism will only ever be a vehicle or a catalyst. It really depends what you do with it. Not all asceticism is wrong. Um, Certainly standing on one foot is probably useless, or uh, eating, eating the wind probably won't help you. I mean, food is necessary to keep the body in an, in an ordinary state that you can, so you can uh, observe the ordinary natural state. If you go without food, you won't be able to see certain interesting... Um, it's like you, you, you won't have the potential to see uh, those things that that cause defilements to arise, for example, the chemicals, uh, the hormones in the body, for example. If you can't observe them, then you won't be able to... Um, the understanding uh, in regards to those, the, the feelings that arise, um, that understanding can never arise. So as a result, you, you can never truly be free from things like lust or, or anger or um, fear or so on because you haven't given it the opportunity to arise, you've repressed it and, and you're in a very weak state. So you won't be able to, it will only come up very weakly and uh, you, it's, there's not the challenge necessary to overcome the problem because the problem never arises. So, for example, not eating, this is not a good idea and so on. But even for asceticism like um, only eating one meal a day or not never lying down, so only doing walking and sitting meditation, or, or uh, never lying down, you know, this kind of thing. Even these practices are not in and of themselves of any real use, any intrinsic value. The only intrin thing that has intrinsic value is, in, in the end, the wisdom and understanding of how things work. And Sankata Dhammanang, it's really an interesting, kind of a rare... Um, form, but the idea here is the ability to tell the difference between good and evil, and good and bad. So, um, in 
you know, in, in Buddhism it's um, the, the act itself is uh, not that which we consider to be bad but it's the intention behind it so when a person has this understanding of um, what, um, what leads to happiness and what leads to suffering this is considered to be the most valuable I guess the, the, the obvious thing to point out here is that a person who practices asceticism or is, is devoted to asceticism is actually devoted to a practice that is, is potentially a cause for suffering. And so the question is, what is your goal if you're causing yourself suffering? You know, is your goal to suffer? Because that seems like an uh, irrational goal when the definition of suffering is something that is really by definition unwanted. So how can you say you want to suffer? There must be a reason why you're doing this. In fact, the reason for any rational person turns out to be they believe a belief that this is somehow going to lead them to happiness. So this is actually what it means to be able to weigh the Dhammas. It means to be able to understand and measure that which truly leads to happiness. So goodness in Buddhism, goodness and evil, have everything to do with how they bring you happiness or, or suffering. And actually these kind of asceticisms, uh, for the most part, only lead to suffering. So they're considered to be the one extreme. It's the kind of thing that people who have left the home life full of sensual desire, seeing that extreme, you know, are, are liable to undertake. It's also something that even, as I mentioned before, in modern times we find people uh, undertaking, people who push themselves and do something just because it's difficult, thinking that there's some value to the hard work ethic, you know, that, that something uh, is valuable just because it is hard to do or just because it is work, uh, hard work. And the Greeks had, of course, this nice um, legend of Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the hill. And uh, we always refer back to that. It, you know, just pushing a boulder up the hill isn't any use because at the end it just falls back down. It's, there's such thing as a useless endeavor. On the other hand, something can be quite pleasant. Just because something is pleasant, it's not something to be afraid of. And so this is kind of um, where true ascetics go wrong. Um, they think that somehow it's wrong to indulge in pleasure, and that there's a, or not indulge, it's wrong to allow pleasure to arise, and that they, they, they aren't able distinct to distinguish between the pleasure and the desire for the pleasure, or the pleasure and the, the enjoyment of it, the liking of it. It's possible to experience the pleasure as an ordinary or, or experience it as it is without attachment, without any kind of uh, desire or, or um, liking of it, uh, any kind of attachment to it. So it's just experiencing it just as you would experience pain. So we tell meditators not to be afraid of pain. Well, likewise, you shouldn't be afraid of pleasure, but you shouldn't be a, a, attracted to either uh, as well. And so um, I think in, in essence, the important point for us as meditators to keep in mind here is it really is about your understanding and your ability to discern that which is of benefit. You shouldn't do something just because someone tells you that this is going to be of benefit to you. You know, if I tell you to walk back and forth or to sit still uh, in your room, that in and of itself isn't... A, you know, isn't where your focus should be. It isn't where the benefit is going to come from. The benefit is going to come from your understanding, which I am telling you is going to come uh, as you're walking and as you're sitting. And that's where your focus should be. When you're walking, you should be trying to understand. You know, not actively thinking about it, but you should be trying to see things as they are uh, and, and cultivate this clear awareness of this is lifting, this is moving, this is placing, this is rising, this is falling, this is pain. Just observing. Once you observe, that's how you come to weigh things. You don't judge, you don't have prejudice, uh, you don't uh, intellectualize or, or, or fall, into, fall back on logic or reason. Just observe. It's really enough because with enough observation, you can detect patterns, 
you can detect cause and effect um, and so you can tell the, the difference for yourself between that which leads to happiness and that which leads to suffering then you become someone who has is able to weigh the dhammas and measure uh, states which is better than 16 times is more than 16 times better 16 is just a round number it's a, they were hexadecimal back in those days so it just means like a fraction it's, it's, asceticism isn't worth a fraction of the goodness it's not worth a millionth part of the goodness that comes from understanding so that's verse 70 and the story that goes with it that's all for today thank you for tuning in and um, tune in next time for uh, the next